This is the most detailed and in-depth video about the new Turkish Khan fighter that you have any hope of seeing on YouTube. And what better introduction than... Please sir, don't do that. The Akinci Air Base, formerly known as Murtad Airfield, is not far from Ankara in central Anatolia. On the base there is a 3,300 meters runway oriented 2103. It used to host three fighter squadrons, but now it has a different purpose. Just beside the runway there is a large compound where Thai runs its operation. Turkish Aerospace Industries is a large conglomerate active in the aerospace industry, one of many in Turkey. The 21st of February 2024 was destined to be a day different from any other day for the men and women working at Thai. The Khan prototype had been sitting in its hangar for a while, more than two years, while being carefully assembled and tested. Ground trials happened in the previous months, but in the morning of that Wednesday, the aircraft was getting ready for the first flight. Who knows what went through the mind of the very experienced test pilot Barbaros de Mirbas when he aligned the aircraft for takeoff at 8.05 in the morning. The aircraft accelerated under the thrust of the twin engines, it slowly rotated and then something unexpected happened. The tail surfaces wobbled, apparently out of control for a few seconds, but the aircraft remained stable and it lifted itself off the runway. The flight lasted for 13 minutes, reaching the speed of 230 knots and an altitude of 8,000 feet. The landing was uneventful, and after that the celebration began, and rightly so, because that flight was an historic achievement for the country. And like all the achievements that are worth their while, it came from far, far away. Yeah, Otis, I know, I know. I, I don't know. I don't know how we could have missed this. Do not blame me, sir. You are responsible for the channel editorial line. It all started in 1974. In my defense, I was only six years old and Otis wasn't built yet. In 1974, Turkey intervened in Cyprus in response to a coup d'etat which aimed to join the island with Greece. Contrast between the Turkish and the Greek population had deep historical roots. The intervention split the island in the two entities which remain today, the Republic of Cyprus and the Turkish Cypriot state. We don't care about the politics of these events in this video. What matters for our story though is the fact that the US in 1974 imposed sanctions on Turkey particularly on military equipment. And Turkey, till that moment, was completely dependent on US imports. The sanctions were removed in 1978, but those four years left a deep scar in the institutional memory of the Turkish armed forces. The experience of combat system falling apart for lack of spares and expertise remained burned in the Turkish institutional memory the mutual trust will never be complete again. So, the Turks did what often happens when a state is sanctioned. They started to invest in their own internal capabilities to replace the imports with the help of the Europeans, obviously. These events marked the birth of the modern Turkish aerospace industry. The breakthrough, though, happened in 1983 when a contract for the licensed production of the F-16 was signed with General Dynamics and a joint venture with General Electric was established for the engine's production. And this was only possible because of the increasing strategic relevance of Turkey after the Iranian Revolution, but also in the climate of heightened tension in the last decade of the Cold War. That was enough to overcome the diffidence, but it was more a marriage of interest than a marriage of love. The value of these contracts from the Turkish point of view was mostly in creating a critical mass of trained personnel. These people benefited from the contextual technology transfer. 
The F-16 related contracts were not the only one to be established at that time and the domestic capabilities were set in a growth path that did not stop with the end of the Cold War, unlike it happened in the rest of NATO. In fact, the Kurdish separatists and the tension with Greece did not allow for a slowdown of military investments. There have been highs and lows due to the Turkish political instability, but the trend toward a domestic upskilling and improvement remained, and it was stable. Well, at least till 2002. In 2002, the AKP party, under the leadership of Tayyip Erdogan, came to power, and the effect on the defense industry was not negligible at all. The joint venture model, in use at the time, had the problem that the most cutting-edge and military-critical technology was still difficult to acquire. For example, there have been frictions with the United States relative to the software for the F-16 and the AH-1 Cobra. The latter led to the customization of the Italian attack helicopter A-129 Mangusta for Turkey in place of the AH-1 acquisition. So these considerations and the different political orientation of the new government shifted the policy towards fully indigenous solutions. This was a big shift, obviously, but it was possible in the context of the relatively quiet international situation and the strong economic growth of the early 2000s. Industry was restructured, it was partially nationalized, and the growth of a supply chain ecosystem was incentivized. Several indigenous projects like the Milgem, Atak, and Anka were initiated. Through these new investments, Participation to international programs like the A400 transport and the F-35 was achieved. Then, in the mid-2010s, something that was believed to be impossible actually happened. In a tender for surface-to-air defenses, the export variant of the Chinese HQ-9 missiles was selected and the whole of NATO went ballistic. The order was subsequently cancelled under international pressure, but this marked the beginning of a period of increasing attrition with the US. A general reluctance to further cooperation appeared in the military commercial background. Unofficial sanctions were placed, again, on military supplies. This heightened tension caused issues with the availability of base components once more, thus underlining the worst issue of the Turkish defense industry. What was built so far was a formidable system integration capability that was resting on imported components like microelectronics and sensors. In times when these foreign-made parts were difficult to procure, the entire industry suffered. In the aftermath of the 2016 attempted coup, the Turkish perception and international position changed again, with Western suppliers being increasingly cold toward Turkey. However, this did not stop the Turks. It simply prompted the search of alternative suppliers and the race for national replacements. The purchase of the Russian S-400 system in 2017 was a watershed moment that led to Turkey being ejected from the F-35 program. The US issued a formal act that almost, almost cancelled all cooperation with Turkey. And here we are, in the early 2020s, a time when, despite all the challenges, the Turkish military-industrial complex is thriving. Turkey has become a world leader in unmanned vehicles, the Turkish military industry is becoming more and more capable and less and less reliant on foreign input. But the big payoff of this story is coming now, because now there is the Khan. In December 2010, the SSIK, a state committee overseeing and coordinating the military and industrial production, had a special meeting. On that day, the Chief of General Staff, General Izik Kojaner, and the Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan had joined the committee. There was a special decision to take. 
Turkey was already a third level member of the F-35 international program. A large section of the aircraft fuselage was planned to be built in Turkey, together with some other components. The F-35 was expected to replace the older aircraft in the Turkish inventory, but the F-16s, the core of the Turkish Air Force, were not going to last forever. In 2010, it was time to think what to do with these aircraft. There were several options possible, buy something else already on the market, join an international program or go for a national solution. At that time, the Turkish aerospace industry was quickly developing, but building a national combat aircraft from scratch, that was a tall order. The decision taken in December 2010 was an ambitious one. It was decided that Turkey's strategic security was proportional to its independence from abroad. So the only way forward was to become independent for high-end aircraft too. That was the moment when the Khan project or the National Combat Aircraft, as it was officially named, was born. Thai and Tuzas were awarded a preliminary contract for the aircraft and the engine, respectively. In 2013, a mock-up was presented at Le Bourget International Air Show, and it was clear to everyone that the Turkish, this time, meant business. What was shown was not a light fighter, not a traditional one, it was a fully-fledged fifth-generation combat aircraft with stealth features. And remember, this was before Turkey being ejected from the F-35 program. In March 2015, the official tender for the full-scale design and production of the aircraft was issued. Tyrol, well, was not in discussion, but the Turkish engine industry did not really have the know-how to design an aircraft engine from scratch. General Electric, Eurojet and Znekma, which is now Safran, presented an offer. Very cleverly, the tender called for design and production to be set up in Turkey and for complete technology transfer. The story of the engine for the Khan is quite complex. The French left the competition, the Americans were lukewarm, but Rolls-Royce, as a member of the Eurojet consortium that built the Eurofighter engine, was indeed interested. However, the negotiation wasn't easy because of the sharing of intellectual property and the issue isn't fully addressed even now, as we'll see in a moment. In the meanwhile, in 2018, the detailed design started. Three different configurations with delta wings or conventional wings, single or dual engine, were briefly considered. But the heavy dual engine fighter model prevailed. For this effort, Thai looked for assistance from more established manufacturer. Originally, Saab was contacted, and then Rostec self-proposed with UEC covering the engines. In the end, the British buy system was selected. However, there are rumors that the Turks are not happy with buy systems, and they are not going to involve the British manufacturer anymore. In 2021, after only three years, the construction of the first prototype started at the Thai facilities in Akinci, near Ankara. Then, a grenade was dropped on the program. The first flight was originally scheduled for 2025, but to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Turkish Republic, Thai was requested to fly in 2023. And they couldn't really say no. In the meanwhile, the troubles with the engine did not subside. Developing a modern jet engine is the most complex element of a program and it rivals with the aircraft itself in terms of the effort required. This an agreement for the engine design and production was still nowhere to be seen, a drastic decision was taken. Considering that Tuzas already produced the General Electric F-110 upon license, the engine was selected as a temporary solution for the eight prototypes and the first 20 Block 10 aircraft. And with that problem out of the way, at least for some time, the program hurried forward. 2022 passed, 2023 arrived, and the aircraft started to frantically take shape. Pictures of the assembly started to emerge, and the world held the breath, waiting for the first flight. Did the entire world hold the breath? Otis sir? is a figure of speech. But I was holding my breath because I couldn't wait for a country outside of the traditional aerospace powers to fly a fifth generation aircraft. 
However, I was going to be disappointed. An issue with the electrical distribution held the aircraft on the ground. But then the 21st of February came and the rest is history. As I'm filming, a second flight has already happened and the development is ongoing. The first prototype is a very skeletal aircraft without many systems, but this is normal for a complex program. Eight prototypes are planned, luckily they did not fall into the trap of concurrency. 20 Block 10 aircraft are to be delivered by 2028, then 24 aircraft are expected to be delivered every year for a while. There will be a block 20 in 2030-31, a block 30, the first with a Turkish engine in 2032-33, a block 40 will follow, but since it is supposed to have some rather sixth generation features, it should happen at a later time. So far, the plan is for a maximum of 200 aircraft for the Turkish Air Force, but it is really too early to tell. Azerbaijan, Pakistan and Ukraine have already manifested interest, with Pakistan actually cooperating with the development through a group of Pakistani engineers. And finally, the engine. With the interim covered, Turkey was adamant that the engine had to be national. A separate tender for the engine was issued in 2022, but we don't have an official winner yet. The tender was supposed to be addressed by TAC, which is the joint venture formed by the Kale Group and Rolls-Royce. However, the relationship between the two partners is not easy. And at the moment of writing, June 2023, the intellectual property issues seem to be not fully resolved yet. In the meanwhile, Tay and TR Motor have a backup plan. Building on the experience made with the F-110 engine, they are developing an entirely indigenous small turbojet in the 3 kN class, which will be used as the starting point to scale up to the required trust. They have a long journey ahead, but this would be an entirely Turkish solution. We don't know what is going to happen, and this is probably the most critical point of the entire program. The engine is always a problem for developing industries. And now, the aircraft. The aircraft general configuration is the one we are now used to see most stealth aircraft. It actually looks similar to an F-22 and you would be forgiven to confuse the two in a hurry. The first time I saw it, it reminded me of an Angry Birds character, but well, that, that's probably just me. From a general point of view, we have a sort of a quite large lifting body here in the middle. The wings are the usual, again, for stealth featuring aircraft tapered wing. As you can see, the root cord is much smaller than the tip cord. Mind, these are not delta wings. They really don't look like those and we'll see later that they are not. The aircraft features quite large slats here 
and they are uh, a peculiarity of the aircraft probably necessary for low speed maneuverability but that's just a hypothesis on the flip side the ailerons are quite small for the size of the aircraft which makes me think that the tail surfaces are, are actually tailerons so they can move independently in the first flight they didn't seem to but probably was just a simplified algorithm for the first flight and then you have here on the inside some flaps it's also quite interesting to see that on the tail the vertical surface is really not entirely movable like you we have seen on the 57 and so on but we have uh, probably motivated by um, the russian designs a small tail here obviously the configuration is a twin engine aircraft here and here there's quite a large separation between the two and this means that for example if one is not working and the aircraft needs to fly with just one engine there will be probably some momentum that is going to be compensated and the vertical surfaces the Nyo, don't seem very very large or effective but yeah i suppose it is something that they are considering obviously okay from the front we see the undercarriage which is pretty simple pretty standard nothing special in here just one nose wheel we see the air intakes that are lozenges as is typical on stealthy aircraft where you don't want to have 90 degrees angles and we see that the intakes are separate from the fuselage as usual this is there to avoid the boundary limit ingestion but also that is a position where normally some radiators of it's a good place it's not adding any aerodynamic drag from the front we can see that the wing have a slightly negative the headrail so is slightly unstabilizing however again like in stealth aircraft the tail is canted outwards and this one is stabilizing the wing position is uh, i would say medium high this in itself is actually stabilizing in roll i didn't find a picture that could show the twist of the wingtip uh, compared with the root that is quite an important element to uh, sort of assess the uh, departure resistance of the aircraft but yeah that's uh, that's the thing however the wing is quite thick so is surely not working as a delta wing this is the only triptych of the aircraft that i could find and uh, it's really not that good so yeah it's not really useful structurally speaking the aircraft seems quite conventional there are some bulkheads that you can see here and the thicker ones are obviously the bulkheads where the most of the load is going through it's a quite a classic torsion box nothing special and in modern aircraft uh, modern fighters you generally tend not to see the wing built as a single structure anymore and this is the case too the aircraft itself is not a plastic plane in the sense the structure is built in titanium and aluminium however for this aircraft skin the turks are using composites material as you can see from this picture there are two different colors this is suggesting that there are two different materials unfortunately the turks haven't published one of those uh, uh, pictures that you normally have for established aircraft where they show an exploded diagram of the aircraft showing the materials that have used the can uses the classic geometric style features but we know that radar absorbing materials are being developed the aircraft looks very smooth with few discontinuities so quite suitable for very low observability so in terms of stealth features again we have the usual planform alignment so this line here is parallel to this line here which is parallel to this line here and this line here is also parallel to this line here 
So this means that the radio radiation impinging on the aircraft from the front will be deflected in uh, basically just one direction. From that direction, the aircraft will be very visible, but you need to be very lucky to be looking at the aircraft with your uh, radar or your uh, passive uh, detection systems exactly in that direction. We can also see serration here on the Radum, which is again pretty standard for stealth aircraft. In this picture we can see how the angle between the side of the fuselage and the wing is, uh, well, way more than 90 degrees. And here we can see up close some of the serrations that have been implemented on the aircraft. Pretty much all the movable panels feature serration and is all around the aircraft. Here we can see the air intakes and this sort of blob in here is the S-conduct that is hiding the compressor blades and in this uh, rather blurry picture we can see here the S-conduct that has been implemented in here. Like all stealth aircraft this is causing some uh, recovery loss, I mean pressure recovery losses more than a straight conduct but yeah it's important for stealth reasons. The aerodynamic configuration is quite conventional, the wing is quite thick so it won't likely generate generate a non-linear lift at high angles of attack. From an aerodynamic point of view, the aircraft is quite conventional. Here we have the system of chines that are typical of stealth aircraft, and this is probably sharp enough to generate vortices at high angles of attack that create some nonlinear lift on top of the aircraft body, and also the vortices end up uh, touching the vertical surfaces, which means that they will probably maintain effectiveness even at very high angles of attack. From here you can also see that the aircraft in this middle section is sort of tapered and this is a quite an important feature to reduce the drag particularly at subsonic speeds. However, this kind of tapering may contribute to some level of area ruling, at least partially because the aircraft is definitely not area ruled. In this picture you can clearly see the chain, which is the typical element of stealth aircraft, but also here you can see that is tapering toward the end, is not very visible when you look it uh, from the side. And here we see the tail where clearly we see the tapering and the tail of the aircraft. This contributes heavily to reducing the subsonic drag of the aircraft and uh, it is quite an important feature. Um, it reminds me some Russian designs. From this picture you can also see how big are the tail surfaces and uh, yeah they probably have a lot of authority. And here is a better picture of the tail. The tail is also good housing for a number of systems and um, we will see it later. We can also see here that while uh, the nozzle is not serrated because while well, it's the F-110 engine so it's the standard nozzle. The junction between the aircraft and the engine is indeed serrated. We have plenty of pictures available even though the prototype is missing most of the systems there are some interesting details visible. There are several interesting details on the aircraft. Here on the back we can have probably the housing of the sensor, could be the DIRCM. These are housing probably for the laser warning receivers. This is probably the outlet of the APU and this one is the in-flight refueling receptacle. The Turkish Air Force uses the boom rather than the canister. This view from the back is showing the situation around the engines that we have already seen that the serration is only present here on the side. Also interesting are these cover flaps on the hinges that may have a stealth function but they could also be there to avoid foreign objects into the hinges. Another interesting element is this air outlet 
here. This is not connected with the air intake, so it's not draining air from the air intake. There's no sign of that in the pictures. This seems to actually eject air that goes between the air intake and the fuselage, you know, which is normally the boundary layer. Normally some radiators are in there, and this could be the evacuation of hot air, but yeah, it's a quite a particular uh, detail uh, that is not entirely clear. Since systems today are so important for the combat performance, Turkey has taken the same radical stance as for everything else. The systems need to be built in Turkey. And the key components to build electronics is microchips. There are currently Turkish chip designers, but they are fabulous companies and the chips are built abroad. The government in 2023 has launched an important investment to incentivize domestic design, but also establish a local chip making capability. Sure, Turkey is not independent yet, but it seems to be on the right track. The CAN suite of systems is expected to be one of the most comprehensive among modern combat aircraft. It won't be installed from the start and there will be improvement while the blocks progress. The electric power available on the aircraft is provided by two locally built 120 kV amperes generators, which is a lot, really a lot for a combat aircraft. The aircraft is built with an open architecture and NATO standards, which should make upgrades easier. It is a centralized architecture with a central processing unit built by the Turkish Belgium. The cockpit features the usual Martin Baker ejection seat. The dashboard layout is the common layout of most modern combat aircraft. There is just one large touch screen and not much else. We haven't seen any simulation yet, but it shouldn't be that unusual. The pilot will wear the Tulgar helmet with the usual protection. This helmet has an interesting feature in such it has special sound like the Apple earbuds. Synthetic voices, radio voices and system alarms come from defined position in space around the pilot's head, so they are more easily told apart. And the risk of confusion should be almost completely mitigated. As an audiophile myself, you guys have my attention. Azelsan, if you see this and you want to send me one to try, I am available. The aircraft will be equipped with a standard IFF mode 5 and a Turkish developed directional and discrete data link, functionally equivalent to the F-35 model. I say equivalent because they are planning the same type of sensor fusion as in the F-35, where the important fusion is with the sensors that are not on your aircraft. I won't go over this here because there are plenty of videos on the channel that explain this in detail. When you are done with this video, I suggest you to have a go with those ones because cooperative targeting is not explained anywhere else on YouTube. The main sensor will be the Murad 600 Haiza radar, currently being developed by Azelsan. It features a 2000 element array and the electronics unit seems quite small for the category. It will be based on gallium nitride components, so it will be likely a quite a modern unit. From Block 20, the aircraft will receive cheek and tail arrays, giving the aircraft a 360 radar capability. Currently, only the Suhoi 57 and maybe the J20 have anything similar. No, sir. We risk another meltdown. <laughs> no worries, Otis. Everything is under control. No worries. We know very little about the electronic warfare suite. As usual, the only thing we know is that it will exist from the beginning and a big improvement is expected with the Block 30 aircraft. And so far, we don't have news about Tau decoys, but we can't exclude that they will be there. Though, we know a little more about the optical systems, which are, again, all Turkish and very comprehensive. It will feature a chin-mounted EOT system called Toygan 100, such is the name. This will have forward-looking infrared and targeting functions like the F-35 EOTS. Unlike the F-35 though, it will feature a separate IRST that seems not to be installed on the prototype for passive air-to-air -air search called the Karat 100. It also features 
the Iris 300 infrared based missile warning system. The images taken by the system double as a distributed aperture system, albeit it is not mentioned if they will be projected on the pilot helmet to be able to see through the aircraft like it happens on the F-35. One important addition is the LIAS 300 laser warning system. You may ask why is it needed on an aircraft since no air-to-air -air or surface-to-air weapon is laser guided. It is needed because of the fifth generation passive detection. Infrared search and track systems can't natively determine the distance, so they are often coupled with a laser telemeter that can briefly laser the target and get the distance. So if you detect laser light, you have been spotted. Another important addition is the Yildrim 300 DIRCM, a system that shoots a laser toward the incoming missiles to blind the infrared seeker and obviously it doesn't work with radar guided missiles. As you can see there is an enormous effort connected with the Khan development and I am sure that there will be plenty of teething problems. The Turks clearly understand this, considering that the gradual approach outlined by the various blocks development is already planned. Anyway, the plan is not unrealistic. As we have seen, the Turkish aerospace industry is an advanced industry and they have the will and the resources to pull it off. The Khan armament is another Turkish story that would require a video on its own. And we will do it. Otis, please, okay? The Khan started at the beginning as an air-to-air -air platform. The Block 10 aircraft will integrate the internal armament and it will be air-to-air -air only, with some air-to-ground on the external hardpoints. Turkey possesses the usual panoply of Western weapons for the F-16s, Amrams and Sidewinders. None of these, none, will be integrated on the Khan, at least not for now. The only foreign weapon that will be integrated will be the Meteor. The other air-to-air -air weapons will be the missiles of the Goktug family. This is a Turkish autonomous development. The short-range infrared missile, the Bozdogan, is currently being tested and it is a modern weapon of the class of the IM-9X or the Azram. The Gokdogan, a medium long range weapon in the same class of the Amram, is currently in quite an advanced development state. The Gokhan, an air breathing long range missile, has been announced in 2021 and it is currently in the early development stage. If we move on to the air to ground weapons, there is a long list of indigenous guided systems. Some built around standard NATO dump bombs like the Mark 81, the Mark 83, others completely national. As I said, this is a subject for a long video on its own, so I won't go into the details. And we will do it. Uh, Otis, why are you so keen to work on Turkish weapons? Personal reasons, sir. Hmm. Let me guess. I suggest you not to guess, sir. That's not the end of it, Otis. That's not the end of it. The aircraft will feature a 30mm cannon which is not installed on the prototype. It is designed by the Turkish firm Kanik and it is built in the UK. It is a derivation of the famous Aden 30mm revolver gun with some ballistic improvements and newly designed recoil dampers. Practical range is 2000 meters and it fires 230 rounds per minute. It is compatible with the standard NATO 30 times 113 millimeter rounds, which means that it could use proximity and programmable fuses. We don't know how many rounds will be on board of the can. The weapon base configuration is not completely clear yet because we have no official drawing or schematic. There is a blurry screenshot going around on the internet, but it is worth what it is worth. There are two side bays whose position is clearly visible on the prototype, likely for short range visual range missiles. And there should be two narrow bays, one in front of the other, along the aircraft center line. However, some pictures of the structural box don't seem to support this view. I guess we will need to wait. There should be four medium long range missiles and two within visual range missiles in the internal storage overall. The pictures available also show six external hardpoints under the wing for a non-stealthy configuration. You may have noticed by now that a 
apart from the engine and the ejection seat, this aircraft is completely Turkish. And this is a noteworthy achievement. It is not yet the kind of autonomy that Turkey wants, but they're getting there and fast. Can specifications are not well defined. It may seem strange, but in fact, the Turks consider them more guidelines rather than specific targets to hit. If the can will be somewhat slower or heavier than designed, it will be accepted anyway. The Turkish government has clarified various times that a project like the can is so important that it is not allowed to fail, whatever it takes. They said the numbers that we know, the numbers that have been declared are still sort of round numbers, approximate numbers, because the production variant may change. The length is 21 meters, the wingspan is 14 meters, and the height is 6 meters. For comparison, it is longer and taller than the F-22, but the wingspan is about the same. However, the max takeoff weight of the aircraft is planned to be around 27 tons. For comparison, the F-22 is smaller but heavier at 38 tons. This is likely the reflection of two elements. The different age of the two aircraft with the can being a much more modern structural design and the higher thrust of the F-22 engines that allow for a heavier payload. The ceiling is 17,000 meters and the maximum speed is expected to be Mach 1.8. Thai has declared that the aircraft will be super cruise capable, but we don't know the speed yet. Taking the maximum takeoff weight as a reference, the wing loading is about 450 uh, kilos for square meter. The F-22 in similar condition is around 480 kilos per square meter. This means that the turn performance on the can should be slightly better, but the can doesn't feature thrust vectoring and nobody ever talked about it. The airframe is rated for nine positive Gs, the usual pilot limit, and 3.5 negative Gs. The current power plant, the General Electric F110, features 76 kilonewton of dry thrust and 131 kilonewton with afterburner, which is about 18% less than the F22 for comparison. But the aircraft is also lighter. The prospective Turkish engine should be in the same category as the current F-22 engines. Combat radius, ferry range and fuel fraction are not known yet, so we can't compare them with anything. And one more point before ending this video. I am quite sure that someone in the comments will call me a Turkish shill. Such is the nature of social media. As usual, I'm not, I have no stake in Turkey or to Kiev as political correctness now prescribe, but I know how challenging and excruciatingly intricate is doing what these men and women are doing. Just in Turkey, but everywhere in the world, there is nothing like designing, building and maintaining a combat aircraft. It is the pinnacle of human technology in many respects. The achievement of these people must be celebrated independently from any political controversy or government position. The dirty purpose of any weapon doesn't make the effort behind its making less worthwhile. The blame lies squarely on those who have the power to decide their use, not with those who build them. Here we celebrate the human ingenuity and nothing else. So, thank you very much for having given me your attention. I consider this a honor and a privilege. This video was particularly complex because I really didn't know anything about the Turkish aerospace industry. A special thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon or by being a member. You are absolute stars. You are essential to this operation. And for the others, if you can, please consider supporting the channel or donating in the way that is best suited for you. You can also support the channel by buying a model from Air Models. There is an affiliate link below. I have a small percentage and there is no extra cost for you. So this is the end. Thank you very, very much for watching and see you next time.